You are listening to the Ivy Podcast. Learn from the thought leaders in areas of strategy, innovation, negotiation, and all things leadership. We interview the Ivy League, Fortune 100, and top startups. Now, here's your host, John Karsibayev. On this episode of the Ivy Podcast, we host Albert Santalo. He's the founder, president, and CEO of 8Base, an application development platform and ecosystem. Previously, he was the founder and chairman and CEO of AcareCloud, a company that provides clinical, financial, and administrative software and back office services to healthcare providers. Welcome to the Avi Podcast, Albert. You're currently CEO of 8Base, a low-code development platform and developer of ecosystem transformation. Can you please tell us more about what problem is 8Base solving through its products and services? Sure. Well, listen, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, you know, look, I, I come from a background of, uh, I'm an engineer originally. I've been an entrepreneur in the lead role in venture back companies twice. And I also did a stint in management consulting where I helped large companies through what was then called IT transformation in many ways has become digital transformation today. And having lived all of that, I always thought that anything related to technology development was just way too hard, took way too long, cost way too much money. And so that was really the genesis of 8Base. The original idea behind the company was to make the journey for an entrepreneur to build their product to scale correctly the first time around to make that a lot easier, right? Less funding requirements, less time to market, less concern about you know doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. And that, that has since evolved to, to apply not only to entrepreneurs, but to apply to larger companies in the efforts that they're making for digital transformation, which oftentimes sort of looks like what a startup has to do, right? It's the, it has to be a customer facing technology, which is very different than an employee facing technology. Um, and oftentimes these large companies, they lack the skill sets to do that in a modern scalable way. Right. Right. That's very interesting. And thank you for sharing that. Um, during my studies at HBS, there were numerous case studies on digital transformation. Um, as 8Base aims to help companies with digital transformation initiatives, what are some of the most effective strategies that have helped you in succeeding in designing and executing an organizational transformation you know, strategy, so to say, from that digital standpoint? Yeah, yeah I mean, look, it, it's interesting because obviously the focus is this is a technological transformation, but really the more important thing is that it's a people transformation, and that usually is what is hard. Um, a lot of the times the people that work inside of a company are bought into the status quo, whether it's because their compensation depends on it, their political clout depends on it. Um, people don't necessarily love change. They don't like to think about having to you know, learn a whole new skill set, start from scratch, not have the power that they have with the knowledge that they have today. So it's a scary thing. And that usually is the inhibitor inside of a company more than it is the technology. So CEOs that do this successfully understand that. They understand that this is a culture change. They understand that certain types of people within the company or maybe externally are the ones that are best suited to lead these things. And they usually create some sort of separation between the organization that's driving the transformation and the rest of the organization, at least for a while, while these things are getting developed. And then they go out and they source the skills that they need because oftentimes they don't have them. A great example would be, you know, most of the people that are working inside of IT in a large company are working on technologies that are 10 year old or or older. They're usually working on maintenance type activities or operational type activities versus creative sort of development activities. And so going out and finding those creative entrepreneurial skill sets, which it's, you know, it, it begins with the engineers that are working with the latest and greatest tools and whatnot, but it's also designers and marketers and the type of people that you need to really do these things. And then more, more than anything, having the courage to undergo it, because oftentimes these transformations can cannibalize your existing businesses. Yeah, absolutely. I like what you said at the beginning. It's not so much the digital aspect. It's more, <clears throat> it's more of a people transformation. Yeah. That's where it starts. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, a lot of times when companies take on these, you know, transformational initiatives, they overlook that component that it starts with the people. Definitely. Um, you've mentioned uh, 
something around you know the types of people it requires to succeed with transformation initiatives like that. Um, when hiring for eight base or any of your pre previous um, initiatives, for those candidates that get you know interview with you, do you tend to get creative with some of your interviews? And if so, what do you look for in some of the responses? Yeah, you know, I, I try to I try to get creative in the in the interviews. It it will depend on the role that they have. It's very different if you're interviewing an engineer, a designer, a senior executive, a marketing person. Uh, it'll vary a little bit, but usually I want to understand. You know, I'm trying to align them along sort of my three principal dimensions of what I consider a successful employee, which is. The number one thing is that they have to be, they have to have a healthy dose of curiosity. So it has to be somebody that uh, is a lifelong learner for obvious reasons in the world today. You know, what you know today will be obsolete a couple years from now. And if you're not constantly learning, I don't care how much experience you have, um, you're not going to be successful, especially in a company like ours. Number two is they have to have a great attitude. And that great attitude has to come to work every single day, whether it's a good day or it's a bad day, um, because the bad attitude just tends to impact everybody else's uh, ability to get their work done. And then the third thing is that they have to have a healthy work, work ethic. And so everything else is important too, right? Their, their educational experience, their work experience, their intellect, all these other things. But I've always found that if you don't have the first three, um, you're not going to be successful in one of my companies. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I'll ask them things like, you know, what advice do you have for your previous boss? See what they come up with, you know. Mm -hmm. See if they, if they have something truly constructive or is it, is it something a little more toxic, you know, and that helps me sort of figure out what type of person they are. Um, and then, you know, something else might be, what's the most interesting thing about you that we wouldn't learn from their resume. I'm always astounded by what I get back from that, things that you never expect. So it's things like that. Great, thank you for sharing that. And there you go for some of our listeners who potentially will be interviewing with Albert. <laughs> you have some insider there information. There you go, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but that's great. And I like the breakdown in terms of those three principles because at the end of the day, you can't really teach personality. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's really great. tough. Really, really tough. You know, unless you're in the military and they break you down, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work in business for sure. Absolutely. Um, to shift the gears a little bit, um, your previous ventures, such as Care Cloud, which is a healthcare modernization company, and Avicenna, which is RCM company for physicians, are in healthcare industry. Is your background in healthcare and what motivated you to launch these companies in this space? The reason it's interesting to me is because we come from healthcare IT background, having worked at you know different healthcare companies, yeah. Envision Healthcare, just to name a few, and it's uh, it's an interesting space. Yeah. And there's a lot of room for improvement. Sure. Uh, so I'm just curious to uh, get your take on that. Yeah. No. So so I um, I originally started in financial services. When I was a working engineer, it was, it was in what would now be called fintech. And, uh, and then later on, I, I did a stint in healthcare technology. And uh, I was just blown away by the difference between financial services and healthcare in terms of technology enablement. So I always thought there was a very large opportunity there. Um, in between that part of my life and the entrepreneurship part, uh, I worked in management consulting where I worked mostly with large US based companies in their global operations related to everything that technology touched. And uh, so I saw a lot of patterns that I had seen in my earlier life in, in many, many different industries. And um, when it came time to jumping into the lead role as an entrepreneur, the biggest opportunity I had seen so far was, was healthcare. And so that's why both of my previous ventures were in healthcare mm -hmm. uh, or are in healthcare. Both of those companies are still around. And, you know, I'm not uniquely a healthcare person. I know a lot about it. Um, I still believe the industry has a long, long way to go. But for my third company, I really wanted to do something a little bit different, um, which is not unrelated, right? But it, it goes back to my engineering roots. Having, especially at CareCloud, you know, the, the system that we built at CareCloud, incredibly complex. And as I observed what the engineers were doing every single day, 
80% of what they did was what we would call non-unique systems. It was things that would power any SaaS application, mm -hmm. but not necessarily anything related to healthcare or our innovation. So with 8Base, what we wanted to do was flip that equation, make it so that 20% was on the non-unique systems and 80% was on the innovation. Very interesting. <clears throat> so some of the problems that you saw actually that you were solving for with the previous companies, uh, you're now you know applying that with some of the you know things that you guys are doing with 8Base to be able to improve that and make things better when it comes to you know code maintenance, deployment, and things like that. So yeah, very interesting. 100%. Yeah, I, and, and my, my entrepreneurial style is also one where I only jump into things that I know extremely well. Mm -hmm. Like, I've, I, I, I've been living the problem in one way or another. I understand the space, and, and, and then I have the, the, the courage, for lack of a better word, to get in. Yeah. <laughs> Before that, I, I, I'm not the type that jumps out of a plane without a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a good yeah. analogy. Um, <clears throat> RPA, AI, machine learning, and... Other advanced technologies are uh, reinventing software engineering as a whole. Yes. Um, what trends do you think will make the most impact on how companies digitally transform in the next few years? So, one of the interesting things I, th I see is is not such a technological one, but really more of a sort of a cultural and design one, which is that if you're building systems for your employees, is very very different stylistically than what you're building for your customers. Most of the, the capabilities that companies' IT departments have are related to employee-based systems, whether they be the core ERP systems or the systems that surround it or the shadow IT systems. Most of the low-code platforms that have enabled that stuff is really about internal systems. But when you think about building for your customer, especially if your customer is a consumer and not another business, the requirements of those systems are dramatically different. Number one, the, the user interface has to be branded in the style of, of your company and it has to be fully consumerized, meaning that you can start using it without any training, uh, it's easy to understand, you know, easy to learn, etc. And that again, different sort of skills that you need to make that happen and what I would also add to that is that templated user interface design uh, software doesn't usually get the job done there. It needs to be a bottoms-up development effort. This is becoming incredibly important as well because of the what we call the user-led era, right? It's traditionally technology professionals were the ones making the decisions around what technology to use. And now it's users inside of companies choosing first and then getting the buy-in from the technology leaders. And so that that's changed the game in terms of how technology is rolled out, how it it, it gains the hearts and minds of the users that it that that, that begin to use it, etc. Um, and I think you know low code in general is going to be a you know companies that embrace low code um, are going to have a tremendous competitive advantage. It's estimated that within five years, 65% of all software built in the world will be built using a low-code or no-code development platform. That number today is probably in single digits. Wow. So it's, it's, it's happening very, very quickly. Um, it's also estimated that companies will have three to four different low-code and no-code tools. So it's not a sort of a winner-takes-all. It'll be different platforms based on different types of enablement. And, you know, I, I like to sort of discuss that in a way that might not be obvious to most people. Because one thing I hear every once in a while is, why do we, why do we need low code if there's a SaaS product for everything? But when you really think about what are the SaaS products that companies buy, it's mostly about enabling their employees. It's not about enabling their customers. And yes, there are SaaS products for a lot of things, but to get 100% process enablement inside of your company, you typically need something that is built, purpose built for you. And to bring in your customer, you need a different type of tool that SaaS products typically don't bring to the table. Right. So I think that low code is sort of like the, the glue and the approach 
of how to modernize and how to bring things together. In some cases, it'll, it'll be RPA. RPA and low code sort of live alongside each other as close cousins. The, the way to think about those is that if you have a whole bunch of legacy systems that you simply want to modernize, RPA is probably the way to go. And if you're thinking of doing away with those systems, low code is probably the way to go. So some combination of those things is the right thing. And that is the glue that brings in things like machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and some of these other things. Very interesting. And uh, so for, for the, for the non-technical portion of our audience, when we talk about low code or as it compares to, let's say, open source, can you just in, in non-technical terms, how would you explain that? Low code versus open source? Yeah, or anything yeah. that will allow the company to essentially develop, deploy, or run these applications without extensive resources needed for the development and you know engineering yeah. aspect of that. Gotcha. I'm just curious from that standpoint. Sure. So there, there's been an explosion of technologies out there, especially back-end technologies. And, and we need to think of software in the world today as back-end and front-end. Most of us identify with front end, front end being the user interface of things. But behind that, there is a very complex set of technological infrastructure um, that isn't just computers and disk, right? It's, it's a whole bunch of application services, integrations to other systems and things like that, which is the most, typically the more difficult part of software. Um, the skill sets that power that are hard to find. And so, and, and, and truthfully, there's only at least in my opinion, only so many ways to uh, to make that happen for different problem sets. But if you let developers onto their own devices, they might pick the latest and greatest, not necessarily the best suitable technology for the company. They may explore a lot of different things um, because developers are very motivated to learn new things. And most companies just need, you know, sort of a they, they just don't need a whole lot of variability in the back end. But they need something that works, that gets the system built properly the first time around, and that scales when they need it, and they need for it to be secure. Mm -hmm. And so open source, so if we, if we think about low code, low code comes in with an opinion. Low code comes in with, we think that there are these ways to do things, and assuming that, that the low code product is a fit for the situation, we save you the trouble of having to build all those things or put them together. Open source is sort of the opposite in the sense that open source, there's a lot of development that has, that has happened. These libraries are open to, um, to developers to, to use them, put them together. It's a very, very powerful model, but it's still very much of a bottoms up development driven model versus a model that starts with an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that at least 80% of the things that I see are well suited to the right low code platform. You know, if you're a SaaS company, there's only so many ways to do that. If you have a, you know, data science requirement or a big data requirement or both, um, you know, there's a certain way to do those things. Mm -hmm. If you have a, um, a marketplace or a social network or a workflow-driven SaaS app, there's only so many ways to do that. And do we really need to reinvent the wheel every single time? Right. And what's worse is, you know, what I'm seeing often is that, especially entrepreneurs, they're trusting these architectures to people that are ill-equipped to do it. Uh, a lot of times these are marketing agencies that grew up web as, as website builders. And now they're asking to build digital applications. And what's happening is that the products look right, but they break, they fall apart when you need to do anything either at, 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 at scale or you need to pull information out of these systems. They're just not architected correctly. And so the concept that giving people full flexibility on architecture actually drives a better result, I would say most of the time it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it doesn't. If you leave that to the most technical people in the world, maybe it does. But most of the time, giving people uh, a starting point that gets them 80% of the way there is a much, much better thing. Very interesting. And you've mentioned something as 
the requirement for a very niche and hard to find skill set uh, that would be able to provide you with these opportunities to scale or you know create these tools for organizations to be able to run, develop, deploy you know applications from that standpoint. Curious, we're we're based out of South Florida, and you know, eight base. You guys have you know resources all over the world, I understand? But you guys are based here as well. Um, we've seen an emergence of different, really unique and very cool companies uh, come up here in South Florida. But from talent perspective, um, I think there's still there's still limitations. There's still opportunities for for more. Um, as you guys look for, you know, to expand aid base or, you know, for partners and, you know, in that domain skill set, how hard is it for you guys to, to find, um, you know, this talent and what strategies do you have in place that allows you to attract some of the, you know, very unique skill set? Sure. So fortunately, the world has changed quite a bit. You know, talent is a problem everywhere. So I, I've never been anywhere where there's so much talent that uh, that it's easy, um, and that includes Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, you have you know, have an abundance of talent, but you also have an abundance of demand for that talent. And the people are expensive; they're hard to keep. Um, so, so this is a challenge everywhere. Fortunately, the world has gotten very flat, and we're able to work using remote teams pretty easily. So, you know, we always prefer having people here, but they, they don't necessarily have to be here. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot right now in Austin, Texas, and, you know, our uh, one of our lead guys basically said, you know, I want to I live in Texas. And we said, great, go live in Texas. It's fine. Shouldn't affect anything that we're doing. In fact, I would say that building a capability to have a, a remote team is a huge competitive advantage for any company these days. Yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, we see emergence of that as, you know, that's our space. That's where we operate from talent management perspective for executive search. But the the growth for, you know, the remote workforce or gig essentially yes. you know, resources, uh, it's it's on the rise. We see a lot of that, you know, a lot of a lot of growth in that area. And I think a lot of companies that embrace that model, I think they will have definitely a lot greater competitive advantage from that standpoint. I think they have to, yeah. you know, absolutely. Um, a good portion of our listeners are second year MBAs, you know, mostly Ivy League. And uh, in terms of the culture that you're building uh, within the aid base, um, what, uh, what, what can you share from that standpoint for anyone who is looking to either join a big corporation or up and come, you know, a startup like aid base? What would be <laughs> kind of the inside look into that type of uh, environment? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. I would say so. How would I how would I define the culture? So, um, it's a hard charging culture in the sense that you know we have we have large ambitions. We're in a hurry to go realize those ambitions. Um, we hold each other pretty accountable to that mission, uh, and the team generally works extremely hard to accomplish it. But. It's, I, I like to think of it as a kind of place where, you know, you blink and the day is over. Like you, you feel like um, it wasn't really work. It was a lot of fun and you were doing challenging, uh, fulfilling things. And it's incredible. I, I can't express to you how powerful it is to see, especially entrepreneurs, show up and say that they want to build on 8Base and we're a part of that and watching those entrepreneurs fulfill their dreams at record speed, right? And by the way, so sometimes they're just building on our platform, and sometimes we act, we have a team also that helps them build if, as an optional service. So sometimes we take the lead on designing and building the product on our own platform for the entrepreneurs. And that's an incredibly fulfilling thing. And so if I take that and I extrapolate what does that mean in the future, one of the things I've always tried to infuse in my companies is that, you know, you're not necessarily expected to work there for the rest of your life, but we want you to be better from having been there, both better on your resume, better as a, as, as, as just, you know, an athlete in general, for lack of a better word, just a better business person. 
But the ultimate of that is that you go off and you create your own venture and you take what you learned in a base, you know, the entrepreneurial learnings that you that you got here and you make a business for yourself eventually someday. And now with a base itself, we have an even greater mission, which is you might as well build it on on our platform. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's probably the best way I would describe the, the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, recently I interviewed uh, CTO of uh, OfferUp. Um, Amish and you know they they kind of you know in the startup yep. phase as well they grow in tremendously but something that he mentioned when we talked about that building that culture is within the lines of what you were talking about and I like what he he labeled that as a having that startup stomach almost to be able to come in and you know without any you know push motivation to have that you know self start yes like self starter and at the end of the day as a founder and CEO of the company it's, I'm sure it's extremely rewarding to see uh, people being you know self motivated to drive and you know put in the work and the resources into building something on the platform that you guys are creating I think that's uh, very unique absolutely um, Last no, it gets, it, 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 it's easy to get up in the morning with that mission. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure we'll live, yeah. we'll, we'll live that on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, last but not least, I'm sure you, I'm sure you read a lot, and I'm just curious what what are you currently reading, and if there's a book that you always recommend to others, uh, what would that be, and and why? Yeah, the, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of books I would recommend for different things, but. Um, what a book that I'm that I'm finishing now is called Sell More Faster. It's written by a gentleman named Amos Schwartzfarb, who's the managing director of Techstars Austin. Uh, Amos has has been a successful entrepreneur, sales leader in six or seven companies, and he sort of got this down to a science. And so you know every every startup needs to sell one way or another, whether it's on the internet or it's hand to hand combat, and so. Amos has done a, a really, really nice job of putting the formula down. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I'm really enjoying that book. I think that, you know, a couple things, a couple other books that come to mind is Zero to One from Peter Thiel that um, really talks, you know, I think that the thing that stands out to me most in that book is is the counter counterintuitive nature of finding product market fit and how narrowing your market down to the customers that will absolutely buy your product every single time and then expanding from there is not it's not typically the way entrepreneurs think yep. they think about going after big markets yep. but I found that to be incredibly valuable and then um, another book I was really surprised about is a book called Traction by Gabriel Weinberg which is all about sort of operationalizing sales and marketing uh, all the different disciplines of it and how do you best do it and case studies uh, about how others use those those plays I thought was really really helpful excellent thank you for sharing that uh, definitely seems like very interesting books and for listeners we'll include the links to these books with the episode notes Albert I know you're a very busy guy thank you for finding time to meet with us and I look forward to reconnect with you in a couple of years to see you know how far the aid base has grown and it's always interesting to you know to revisit that and you know kind of refresh the conversation we had you know a couple of years ago to see how much has changed so definitely look forward to that absolutely well thank thank you very much this is great Thank you for listening to the Ivy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our RSS feed on ivypodcast.com and all major podcasting platforms like Spotify and iTunes. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a rating on iTunes.